<clears throat> what if I told you that the advertisements you see every day not only had the power to influence your purchasing decisions, but could also inspire the spread of ideologies of hatred? My name is Jonas Camp, and today I'll be giving you a history of German advertising with a focus on the World War II era in an effort to show the power that advertising can have over a society. <clears throat> I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee, which recently has established a new Volkswagen assembly plant. With that, many German families have come to Chattanooga, and there was a need to establish an international curriculum in my high school. This is the International Baccalaureate Program. Within this program, I was able to learn alongside German students and became interested in German culture. This understanding of German culture should aid me in my advertising major as it will help me to understand the global scope of the industry. <clears throat> now, why is this relevant? Well, there are benefits to working internationally, whether we do it one day or not. That involves the development of communication skills such as precise wording when speaking across cultures, and also the idea of becoming more international-minded. This involves the understanding of different business structures, which can help you to solve problems with unique solutions and can also give you a competitive advantage over others in your field. <clears throat> now, today we're going to be talking about advertising through a history of Germany. We're going to be talking about the early advertising years, pre-war years in World War II, and post-World War II and modern advertising eras. Now, a bit of a history. Germany became an industrialized state in the 1870s. This led to a growth in population, an increase in wealth, and an increase in the ability to purchase consumer items. In 1894, the Imperial Patent Office was founded. This allowed companies to patent their ideas for items such as food, clothing, and tobacco, as well as other products. In 1907, Hermann Mutatius's Deutsche Werkbund was created, which allowed companies to advertise their products with unique selling points. This created advertising in its earliest form. The individuality of brands was stressed during this time. Now, that takes us to World War I, where advertising saw a decline. In the years following, Germany was forced to pay harsh reparations payments. But in 1925, the United States bailed them out, reestablishing their market. With this came innovations in advertising. The use of scientific research in areas such as psychology made ads more effective. There was also a change in social distinctions. No longer were people seen for the traditions of the Wilhelmian period, but were instead seen for their ability to purchase consumer items. German artists sought to create a unique image. Here we see this Trump Schokolade ad, which is a German chocolate brand. And you see how artists sought to use bright colors and stylized artwork rather than photography, which was common at the time. Now, advertising began to be used also as a tool to spread ideologies. We see international brands also using these ide ideologies to sell products. We have Coca-Cola in the creation of Fanta and Guinness. Here we see a Fanta ad using Hitler's image. Fanta was actually a Nazi Germany creation. Unable to import the syrup needed to produce Coca-Cola, the factory instead turned to beet sugar and apple pomace to create a fruity soda distinctly German. Here we see a Guinness ad using a German soldier. It states, it is time for a Guinness. And here we see even a German Zeppelin holding Guinness and two cans alongside it in a distinctly German style. Now, in 1933, the Reich Ministry of Enlightenment and Propaganda was created, headed by Joseph Goebbels. According to the American Holocaust Memorial Museum, Goebbels used propaganda to create a leader, support a cause, and create an enemy. Here we see Hitler, prior to his election, being shown as our last hope for the German people who were suffering through the Depression. Here we see Hitler being established as a man of tradition, shaking President von Hindenburg's hand. Here we see a different type of ad, advertising for euthanasia in German hospitals. During the war, 
German soldiers who were wounded and people who were ill were seen as a burden on their country. It states, living only as a burden. Here we see the anti-Semitic propaganda that was present throughout Germany during this time. The people truly believed that the Jews were the problem because that was what was given to them. It states, behind the enemy string, the Jew. Now, because propaganda was handled by the government during this time, advertising bounced back immediately after the end of the war in its traditional form. There was an international presence, however, with American agencies beginning to merge with German agencies. This created some of the largest agencies that we know today, such as McCann Erickson, Ogilvy and Mather, and DDB. There were also independent German agencies, such as Die Werbe in Essen. Here we see one of their ads. It states, take a break and drink a cola. Notice how it's, it could almost pass as an American ad. Germans sought to uh, create a unique voice through humor, of all things, the last thing that the Americans expected following the atrocities of World War II. Here we see a famous DDB, DDB ad, which states, and if you run out of gas, it's easy to push. The last thing the Americans expected were for the Germans to use self-deprecative humor, but here we see that the Germans were able to break into the American market. Unfortunately, economic difficulties would lead to the lessening of Germans' influence on the advertising industry. The reunification of West and East Germany would make Germany the third largest advertising market in the world, but it remained small in scope. In this study from Statista, it shows the television advertising numbers for the major countries. We see that the United States is far beyond Germany, which ranks fifth. So advertising in Germany is small in scope, but we do see the impact that it's had on advertising today. So today we've talked about how advertising was a response to industrialization and consumerism. We've also seen how advertising is a response to social and political movements. We've seen that it can sell both ideologies and products. And the interconnectedness of advertising makes it important to understand the history and cultures of other countries. I'd like to close with a quote. We're flawed because we want so much more. We're ruined because we get these things and wish for what we had. Thank you. Any questions? In the uh, run-up to World War II, you saw that there were a number of ads that uh, pushed government policies so that the, uh, the, the, the party line, whatever it was being uh, espoused by Hitler, was something that was going to be founding its way into advertising. Did Germans, after following the events of World War II, did the Germans begin to be distrustful of any kind of political advertising following that? It seemed that the Germans were eager to get rid of any Nazi sentiment following the war. And you see that continuing today with the Nazi symbol being banned in Germany. And uh, really, they just choose not to address it at all. What about any other political advertising? Has that changed in tone and tenor because of the events l leading up to World War II? I would say that propaganda is still as strong as it's ever been. In America, we have a free market, and so we are able to express dissenting opinions. But in other countries, they don't have that freedom. So advertising is just, and propaganda is just as strong as it's ever been. Thank you.